welcome back to the channel. Today we are going back into more conventional waters from my point of view. The sort of uh, talk that I really started the channel for. I am a maritime archaeologist, I'm not a ship modeler. And all the videos that I am making seem to be criticism of one kit or another, or lately caught between us and Evo actually building a model. So let us talk about a very well-known shipwreck that has made history in many different ways. Obviously, I am talking about the Mary Rose, the famous character of King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII has received quite unjustly, in my humble opinion, bad rap about his approach to divorce and uh, marriage management, shall we say. I personally see nothing wrong with it. I think that he had a very healthy approach to this uh, subject. And uh, for some reason, I probably uh, that probably is a minority opinion. Returning to King Henry VIII, it is uh, actually quite regrettable that the only thing he's popularly known for is his numerous marriages, equal number of divorces, etc. But the truth of the matter is that he actually was a very competent monarch. It is he who created, or under his orders, who created the Navy Board, which lasted until the 19th century, after the Napoleonic Wars, when it was uh, mixed together with the Admiralty. The Navy Board were in charge of ship construction, ship maintenance, all the technical aspects of maintaining a permanent Navy. Others have said that it is very true he created the permanent Navy, uh, but he created it because he also created the need for a permanent Navy, which did not exist prior to his uh, breakup with the Pope. That's neither here nor there from our point of view. So let's talk about Mary Rose herself. Evidently, quite often, if you are to follow their uh, social networks, you would see that now and then they have to repeat that, unlike Vasa, Mary Rose did not sink on her maiden voyage. In fact, Mary Rose had a very long, very, very successful career. She was considered to be the king's best ship pretty much from the time she was born. She was built, not born, I'm sorry. Two ships were ordered by the king at the same time, and uh, most scholars agree that the one was Mary Rose, the second one, much smaller than her, was Peter Pomegranate. Another controversy that has been up and down is what, where did the name Mary Rose come from? Some have suggested that this is the Tudor Rose, and uh, that Mary was King Henry's favorite sister. It is more probable that the ship is actually named after Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is also known as uh, the Rose herself. Let's not forget that prior to his uh, marital challenges, and refused divorce, King Henry VIII was very, very devout uh, Catholic, and in fact was considered a defender of the faith. As far as the ship is considered, this is an interesting subject. One of the questions that has um, exercised minds is, did she always have gun ports? Did she have artillery on the lower decks? Or was she only armed in her castles? as earlier characters were. The bulk of the archaeological evidence suggests that she always was with gun ports. It is true that throughout her career, her artillery tended to move towards heavier guns, but fewer in numbers in comparison with the earlier period. No one knows when the gun port was invented or who invented it, but it is quite clear that right around the year 1500, the gun port already existed. We probably will never know exactly who invented it or uh, which ship was the first one to carry it, but we do know that Mary Rose uh, had them. This also is one of the most important inventions of humanity in the history of seafaring. 
because this is what allowed the creation essentially of the future ship of the line. The ability to carry heavy artillery low down in the hull without compromising the stability, well, without compromising too much the stability of the ship, is really what created the whole concept of the modern Navy, who, what enabled humanity to project power over great distances and across seas and oceans. This was the one and only technological advantage that Europeans enjoyed during the great, the early uh, great geographical discoveries and the early period of colonization. That was it. Mary Rose had a long battle career. She fought in pretty much every war of King Henry VIII. Everywhere, every commanding officer of the ship spoke very highly of her. Until, of course, in 1545, most famously in battle against the invading French fleet, she was lost. Without going into too much detail of the battle, there are plenty of other sources where you can read up on it. Um, essentially, a superior French navy bottled up the English fleet into the Solent. They were interested in getting in goading the English out into the open seas, but Howard the Admiral was not a stupid man. Whatever else he may or may not have been, he knew perfectly well that his advantage lays in keeping close in home waters where they knew uh, the waters much better than the enemy on the one hand side. And even more importantly, the enemy could not surround his fleet. And it is in this battle that Mary Rose was lost. We have a number of uh, accounts of what really happened, witness accounts. One of them says that uh, carried the ship's captain as a vessel uh, passed under his stern. He shouted that he has a crew of rogues that would not be governed. And shortly after that, she tacked towards shore and capsized and sank. Why did she sink is as frequently asked a question as the question, why did the Vasa sink? It has become very popular lately to blame for everything aristocrats and especially the kings. This appeals dramatically to Hollywood and to quite frankly, us Americans, but the truth of the matter is that this is one place where the king was not at fault. So, one version of why the ship sank is that one which is spread by the French, namely that a cannon shot from one of the French galleys damaged the ship and uh, as the captain was attempting to run her aground to save her, couldn't quite make it there, capsized, sank, and that was that. Uh, very few of the more than 700 men aboard the ship were saved because of the boarding netting, which kept the majority of the people, prevented them from um, saving their lives, even if they could have done it. The second version, of course, is that simply the ship was highly unstable after the repairs of the 1530s, the rebuilding of the vessel, and that is why it sank. And the third, least popular, but probably the one that is actually accurate, human error. In other words, the captain was right and he did command a crew of rogues that would not be governed. That is certainly uh, what seems to be the most probable cause. We will discuss the archaeology in Alexander McCain set up on discovering the vessel in the Solent. It should be pointed out that the loss of the Mary Rose, of course, lingered on in memory. The story of the Mary Rose was never forgotten. And, most of all, Mary Rose was always known where she sank. Perhaps the position could not be pinpointed, 
but it was known. Pass forward to the 1830s, when the Dean brothers developed a diving mechanism. They were hired by the authorities to blow up and clean up the uh, fairway from the wreck of the Royal George, a ship of 100 guns that capsized and sank a tanker in 1782 during the end stages of the American Revolutionary War, killing pretty much the entire crew, including Admiral Campenfeld. Of course, most of the viewers of this channel, no doubt, are perfectly well aware of this. The problem, of course, was that with the bigger ships, the wreck of the Royal George was getting in the way. Sixty years later, she still was practically intact. So the Dean brothers were hired to blow her up and clear up the fairway. While they were in the process of doing this, they ran into another deeply buried and only partially preserved wreck from which antiquated guns started emerging. They raised a number of them. I'm not aware of what happened with them, but luckily their beautiful drawings, measured drawings that were produced at the time, including watercolors, and they still survive. And you can see them frequently in most of the publications on Mary Rose. That, I should point out, is that the brothers Dean knew immediately exactly what ship they were looking at. There was no question that this is the Mary Rose. So, you know, for all practical purposes, the ship's location more or less was known. Uh, McKay, however, set out, McKee, I'm sorry, set out to find the exact location and to excavate the vessel. It, the model that he intended to follow, of course, was Vasa. After all, the two ships were raised about, roughly speaking, 20 years after uh, each other. So in many ways, the Mary Rose has followed in its development as a project, uh, the model of Vasa. Mary Rose is much smaller than Vasa, and Mary Rose also survives only half of the hull. It was excavated over a lengthy period. The project director was uh, the late Margaret Rue, though the archaeological director uh, for most of the season was Professor Jonathan Adams. Well, he's professor now at the time, a very young Jonathan Adams. Many of the people who participated until very recently were uh, still with the Mary Rose, well, at least two. Um, Christopher Dobbs and uh, Alexander Hildred. Miss Hildred produced an incredible study of the armament from the ship. Of all the volumes that came out on the uh, Mary Rose, that by far is uh, the best, in my humble opinion. The ship was raised, conserved. The conservation of the hull itself, really the drying, was completed uh, the first time I saw Mary Rose in 2014, um, the ship was being dried out, the spraying had already ended. An entire museum was designed and built around the ship. And I think that the museum is spectacular. It is really well designed. It is very user friendly for the general public. It brings the story, it brings the orientation, it brings the association of the finds and the artifacts. So it, it almost is a living museum. In many ways, this was one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. It taught us so much about Tudorian life that we didn't know from before that. It is the first time that we could really in detail study the English longbow and finally figure out just how powerful these weapons were. Let me break the news, significantly more powerful than was estimated prior to this discovery. The ship is in excellent state of preservation for a variety of reasons. The bow was cut off and not raised together with the ship. It probably was the correct political decision at the time. The idea was that one day archaeologists will return and finish excavating the forecastle. But to the best of my knowledge, this has never happened. The stem was raised and studied, but I'm not aware of any further work archaeological on the forecastle of the vessel. It took for a very long time, of course, to begin publishing the ship. 
and a series of volumes have been published. Some better, some worse. Unfortunately, the model of the publication is uh, perhaps op open to question. Much of uh, what was published is reading more like a cultural resource management report rather than a final publication. To be fair to the editors, they write in every foreword that this is not the final publication of the ship, this is just a publication. They have gathered all the material and uh, publicized it and made it available to the general public so that eventually a full publication will come out. Unfortunately, that of course is most improbable to happen. Such volumes cost a lot of money to prepare and a lot of time. So the odds of anyone in the foreseeable future having the money, the time and the resources to dedicate to another publication, multi-volume publication in the Mary Rose, uh, the odds are enormous, in my humble opinion. For most of uh, the viewers of this channel, of course, the most interesting part of it would be the hull. And this here is the two-part volume, fourth volume, which is uh, actually it says volume two, but I think it was the fourth one to come out, uh, that contains the analysis of uh, whatever was done with the hull and uh, a proposed reconstruction of the ship. On the sister channel, you can see a review and paging through the books. It's, the link is right up there. Uh, enjoy yourself. There are a few questions. First of all, in the professional literature, the review of this volume was crushing. I'm being polite. Quite a lot of the data is there, but never a detailed study and recording of the framing patterns of the ship. Uh, the detailed recording that you would expect for a real reconstruction of the vessel was not done. It was always intended to be done, but somehow it didn't happen. Um, there are methods of documenting hidden structure that is not visible, but for whatever reason, uh, time was and resources probably were not available to do it for this vessel. The reconstruction, as proposed in the book, assumes perfect symmetry on the part of the ship. And while we can all agree that um, master shipwrights aimed to create symmetrical ships, the practical uh, truth is that few, if any, wooden ships were ever perfectly symmetrical. And that is where we are encountering some of the problems. Other problems, of course, are with the interpretation of why and how the ship sank. And the blame is thrown at the hired Genoese crossbowmen, which didn't speak English, therefore couldn't close the lids on time. Yes, except that the guns could not have been moved back in. There are many, many problems with it. Some chapters are outstanding, other chapters are uh, better off ignored and not spoken about. The galley chapter is excellent. Um, the framing more could have been done, but it is not too bad. The reconstruction itself uh, leaves better to be desired. It's probably a diplomatic way of putting it. While we are on the subject, to finish this video, a couple of thoughts. First of all, it is one wishes that more was done with the hull. That the hull was documented in the detail, please thank you, in detail that it deserves. That an uh, actual ship archaeologist had done the reconstruction. Uh, there are so many excellent people uh, in England, starting with John Adams himself, of course, who would have known the vessel better than him. And there are others that uh, come to mind also who could have done an outstanding job. I do sincerely hope that one day the ship will get the attention that it deserves. What we did with the framing on Vasa certainly can be done in detail on the Mary Rose. But who knows what the future will bring us. It should be pointed out, however, that for God's sake, instead of building yet another 
Santa Maria, or God forbid another victory, try this. At least it is a real ship. There aren't that many models of Mary Rose out there. There are a few, but not many. There are one or two good kits of the Mary Rose that seem to be reasonable to the best of our knowledge of the vessel. And yes, I fully recognize that there is a lot more that we can be talking about on Mary Rose. From the details of the vessel, from uh, comparison between the Anthony Rowe drawings and the actual archaeological evidence, uh, down to the details of the reconstruction, through the history, through the explanation of why and how the ship sank, there is a lot more that can be said. But uh, this is already rolled into more than 20 minutes, I suspect. So with the very best wishes for a wonderful Easter Sunday, I close this uh, video. Thank you ever so much for watching, liking, commenting. I will do my best whenever I can to answer in reasonably close times after uh, the comment. Thank you so much for watching and I'm looking forward to seeing you soon again.